the people of Israel also are almost there. Chronologically, we're about year 38, 39 out of the 40 years where the people have been lost in the Sinai. And a picture that I loved is this. You can see the green line is where Father Abraham began. And he was called in a place called Mesopotamia, or Ur, as you can see there. And God called Abraham, and Abraham traveled along the green line. Up he reached the desert of, the, or the wadi of the Nile in red over there. And the people stayed in Egypt for how long? 400 years, slaves to the Egyptians. And then God called and raised Moses to bring the people out of Egypt. And you can see the red line talks about the book of Exodus, where people exited out of Egypt and went to that yellow spot at the Sinai Peninsula. You can see here the red line is crossing some water. What is that water? The Red Sea, where we hear about the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. And then down in the Sinai, God talks to Moses on Mount Sinai and gives him the commandments. And we know the story of making the golden calf. And all our stu study through the book of Leviticus through, is there in the Sinai. Since we took off from Sinai, we are headed now along the blue line, journeying in the wilderness and the lost desert to reach the promised land, very much like our life today, where we're all journeying in the desert of life, wanting to reach our heavenly Canaan, or heavenly Jerusalem, the land that flows with milk and honey. And where we are specifically, we're at the very top part of the blue line, about to enter into Canaan. Another map that just shows you where the geography of the world at that time, the Sinai, Egypt, and you can see Canaan is up there to your right. I put two red arrows on two nations or two types of people that used to live with the Israelites. Number one, down south are the Midianites, the people of Median, and just north of them, are the people of Edom. And they are very relevant to today's opening story. The story of Peor, or what the Bible commentators call it, the Peor incident. It is an, a tragic incident that happened before they entered Jericho, before they cross back into the land of Canaan in a place called Shittim. Shittim is where the action happens. See, it's the Dead Sea in the plains of Moab where the Moabites live and where Shittim, the land or the city where the Peor incident took place. Why they call it the Peor incident? Because there is a god there that they worship and it's called the Baal of Peor. And that's why the Bible commentators talk about today's story as the Peor incident. What happened there? Let's take a good look. I want you to just focus on two incidents in the Old Testament books of Moses. The golden calf incident, and we've studied that very well, when people worshipped the golden calf and they had sexual relationships in order to worship the golden calf and Moses was not happy, and we all know the details of that. Today is the second incident where people worship idols, and we will see how they fell into sin. Last Friday, I spoke clearly about this prophet, the prophet that was called Balaam, who wanted to curse the people of Israel, but God would not let the curse come true, and he changed the curse into a blessing. Specifically, two parts of the blessings were this, and you will remember them. Balaam said, I see a people who live apart 
and do not consider themselves one of the other nations. That's the meaning of the word what? Holy that we talked about today, set apart. And he blessed them for that. And he also said last Friday, no sin is seen in Jacob. No misery or misfortune is observed in Israel. That wicked prophet said the only way, the only way that God's blessings will leave the people of God is if he breaks these two verses to bring them into sin with other nations. And let's start by reading. Israel, that means the people of Israel, that means the, 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 the fellowship of Israel, the country of Israel, was staying at Shittim. And Shittim is that little, little town by the Dead Sea. And they're only one year from entering the Promised Land. They're about to enter the Promised Land. They have seen the greatness of God throughout the books of Leviticus and Numbers. We read, sadly, that the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women. Who are the Moab Moabite women? They're, they're the people of Moab. You see up there? living in Edom, the people of Moab. And Moab and Midian were very close. You see, Satan sometimes, when he knows he cannot destroy a family, he knows that he cannot destroy us because we're children of God, Satan will simply put temptations in our way. And we choose to fall into them. And Satan still uses this sexual immorality business till today. Do you know that you cannot sell a toothpaste ad without showing some sexual stuff in it? I'm amazed if you want to see a video or an ad for a car that you want to sell, it has to show some sexual connotation. If you want to sell a, a, a watch or an iPhone, it has to show some sexual connotation in your ad. Otherwise, it will not sell. This is the generation we live in today. And that's why the Bible warns us, and today I stand to remind us and remind you and re remind everybody that sexual sin is a big no in the eyes of God. God hates that particular sin. It, the relationship between a man and a woman is like his relationship with the church. God will never forsake the church. God will never leave the church and love some other people. And he expects the church to love him the same way. We are married to our God. And so when we start to deviate and love the world and love other pleasures of the world, we're very much like the people of Israel. And look at how Satan plants the sin in the hearts of these Moabite women, women that are non-believers, not from the Israelite community. They say, well, if you want to have a sexual relationship with us, well, look at verse 2. You must first, what's that? Sacrifice to their gods. What about our God? You know, when you're in the heat of the moment and the lust of the flesh, you forget about your God. And you fall down and you go into sexual sin. That's the cascade of how Satan plays it. Well, you love your church, you love your community, you love God, okay, fine. I'm going to throw you a little twist. I'm going to throw you a little temptation. I'm going to throw you a little seduction. And in serving that man or that woman, that lustful relationship, you are really doing what the Bible says you shouldn't, sacrificing to their God. Sexual immorality equals, in the eyes of God, you are sacrificing to the God of the sexual immorality to Satan. So far, this is outside the Israel people. It is in a city outside where they're living. They're living in the plains of Moab. They want to cross the Jordan to reach Jericho. But this particular event takes place outside the Israelite camp, outside the community of the Israelites. And we read here that the people ate and bow down before these gods. And who is watching? God in heaven. Watching. Watching and hurting. 
watching and disbelieving. His people are sinning against him plainly. And so the Bible tells us plainly, so Israel joined in worshiping the Baal, that's the name of the God, that B-A-A-L is that name of God. And that God was situated in this city, Peor, and that's why they called it the Peor incident, the Baal of Peor. So Israel joined, joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. And rightfully, we read that the Lord's anger burned against them. Who wants God's anger to burn against him? Who wants to be in a place of a people where God looks from heaven and is burning with anger upon what we do? Angry. God's heart is burning with anger when it comes to any sin, but specifically sexual sin. There are two sins that God hates so much. One of them is this, because it breaks the idea of a family, that a husband is to a wife and the wife is to a husband. One man to one woman and one woman to one man. When you deviate from that plan, you are breaking the principle of God. He said, I am one, the relationship of God and us is like a bride and a groom. And many times in the Bible we read that. The second sin is pride. If you are a proud person, you will not see the goodness of God in your life. Pride is that sin that started everything when Satan felt proud and fell out of heaven. Verse 4 tells us, the Lord immediately said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people and do what? Kill them. And expose them in broad daylight before the Lord. To be an example. That's how God deals with sin. It is a bad sin. And God wants us today to kill sexual sin if it lives inside your heart. Kill sexual sin if it lives inside your home. Kill sexual sin if it lives in your workplace. Kill sexual sin if it lives in your computer. Deal with it. Kill it. Kill it just like he said. Take the leaders and kill them. And he wants us to expose things. Expose things in your confession. When was the last time you went to confession? Go and expose Satan. Exposure. Satan likes to hide. Satan likes darkness. He likes things, no light. Wants things to happen in the inside. Expose them just like it is said here. You ask me, how do I fight sexual sin? I tell you, my beloved, read the book of Ephesians. Chapter 6 is dedicated to armory that you can put on that will help you fight sexual sin. And let me be honest with you. Don't fight. Just run away from it. Run away. Run away from sexual temptation. Don't wait. Don't fight it. Don't say, I'm strong. Run away from it. If it's a friend, leave that friend. If it's a place, don't go to that place. Do like Joseph did. He ran away from Potiphar's wife. Run away. Run and don't stay. Let's move on in the story. We read this strange finding. A man, an Israelite man, a man of God, brought to his family. So this man had a family. He was married and had children. Look what this man did. He brought one of the Moabite or Midianite women. And he brought her right before the eyes of Moses. So he brought her inside the, the camp before sin was outside and God was not happy. God wanted to kill the leaders of the community. But lo and behold, this man has the audacity to bring the woman inside the camp of God. And he took her into his tent. Verse 7 tells us that 
Phineas, this important name, Phineas, and he had a father. His father was Eliezer, and that name is important because Eliezer is the son of Aaron, and that name is also important. Who is Aaron? He is the high priest. So, in honesty, Phineas is who? He is Aaron's what? Grandson. So he's the grandson of the high priest. What did he do? When he saw this man take the woman into his tent inside the camp, what did he do? He left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and he followed the Israelite man into the tent, and he drove the spear into the both of them. And he killed the man, and it went right into the wood. When you read the text, you understand that they were actually having a physical relationship when he drove the spear right through the both of them. You read this and you say, this is ugliness. How, how is this happening? How, how can this great sin take place? And then a man even makes it worse by committing a killing. I want to tell you that God blessed and praised what this man did. It shows the ugliness of the sexual sin of immorality. God hates it and wants to, nothing to be done with it. And let me tell you, my beloved, if you have been a victim of such a sin, it is not the end of the world. God would not allow a man to come and drive a spear in your heart. There is a door to cure this. What is that called? The door of repentance. Repent. Come to God and say, Oh God, I cannot get rid of this sin in my life. Help me. I want to change. I want to get rid of this problem that's in my life. And God will help you. Will help you kill the sin that's inside of your heart. Let me tell you that when you read verse 9, you will see that God wanted to kill the whole community. God wanted to get rid of all the people. When this man killed the man and woman, the plague, which we don't know more about, as I said, was it a, a heart problem, a skin condition, a uh, 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 cancer, I don't know. But there was a plague that was going to kill all the people. We read that the plague against the Israelites stopped. But it was late. It stopped after 25,000 people, what? Died. They died. They died because of sin. As we heard in the back room, the wage of sin is death. Many sorts to dying. Spiritual death physical death, but the wage of sin is death. This is the man that I want us to remember, this strong, brave man that is called Phineas. The Bible says about sin, put to death whatever belongs to earth. And the first he put was what? Sexual immorality. It is so prevalent in our workplaces. It is so prevalent on TV and media. It is so prevalent in outside the church. And I don't want to say it's prevalent in the church because it is not. But we have to be awake, alert about sexual sin. And this sin attacks everyone, young or old, single or married, grandfather or granddaughter, grandmother, grandparent, everyone. Satan is out there like a wild lion wanting to pray about us. Get rid of it, sexual immorality. Get rid of it and kill it like we learned. Impurity, kill it. Lust, kill it. Kill it at the very beginning before it spreads and kills the whole community. I hope my message about this is clear. Phineas, the man of zeal. Today we spoke about what zeal meant. Zeal doesn't mean you come and talk to me in the church and say, take your hat off, you're standing in mass. Zeal doesn't come, mean, come and tell the deacon, oh deacon, you should stand up when Abuna is saying this or doing. That's not the zeal we're talking about. Zeal 
is defending God and his holiness. God said to Moses, no problem. This man, Phineas, is a good man. He was zealous. Look at verse 12. Tell him, that's God speaking, I am making a covenant with him. God made a contract with Phineas, and he said, this is going to be an everlasting priesthood. Aaron was the priest, and his son Eliezer was a priest. And then who will be a priest? Phineas. Why? Because of what he did. Because he was zealous. Please, in your zealousy, don't commit sin. In your zealousy, don't be angry at people. You want to talk to someone about, you want to correct someone, do it in love. Do it in respect. And before you correct my problem, correct your problem in your family. Before you come to talk to me about what's wrong in my family, look at your family and fix the problem there. And I'm telling you, when you look in your family, you will find things that you need to correct. It's amazing how the Bible records this incident in detail with the name of the people. He says that the name of the Israelite man who, was, who ki killed with the Midianite, what was his name? Zimri. That's a bad name. Zimri. Zimri. And he was from the Israelite community. And he was from the Simeonite family. You know what Simeonite family mean? He was from which tribe? The tribe of Simeon. And the Bible records the name of the woman very clearly. Her, her name was what? Cosby. In Hebrew, which is very close to the Arabic Egyptian, Cosby is very similar to a lie. Kezba. Cosby. Kezba. That's a lie. So she is a big lie. When you seduce someone into sexual sin, you are a lie. Do you know what God says about, Jesus said in the New Testament about seduction? He said, don't seduce no child of God. It is better that they tie a stone and put it to your neck and dump you in the sea than you fall into that sin of seduction. Don't seduce no one. Don't wear nothing to seduce no one. Don't entice someone into any sexual act or sexual sin. Don't do that. Do not do it. This is against the word of God. She was from Midian. And Midian are a bad people in the Bible. They represent sin and Satan. And the man was from the tribe of Simeon. That incident is important. Keep it in your log. You can forget everything today, but remember the pure incident. Sexual purity is important. Moving on. We see that God told Moses in chapter 26, please count your people. Count them. And I, want, I took this picture and this slide, and I put it up here specifically to remind us that their number was, how much was the number? Six hundred what? Thousand. That's a huge number. That's a huge number. Six, that's more than the Stadium of World Cup. It's a huge number that these people are. And these are the, the details of that chapter. You see the tribes are written there and their census of them. He, he told them, choose everyone who is 20 years or old who is able to serve in the army. So they chose the men who can serve in the army 20 years or more. Today God is asking for young men and women who are 20 years or more to come and serve in the church, and we don't find. We're looking for people to serve in the church that are 20 years. Where are they? I don't know. And that's why the motto, the, the, the responsibility of this church is to gather these young people again to come to the church. I tell you, we're doing pretty good. Go to other churches. There is none. There are no people less than 50 years of age that go to church. They are gone. That generation is adios, bye-bye. No more. They are not available. They have other plans that are more important to them. Why? Because we are not attractive. And we are. We have to fix things. 
We have to fix things in the church. We have to make the church comfortable, well lit, nicely, nice technology, put musical instruments, put singing, Pe people greet at the door. We have to do it that way to invite people to come to church. I'm afraid to say I'm sad we have to do it like that. Sadly, people are not willing to come to church anymore. Look around you and see. So these are the people who are 20. I just want to point out a few things in that census. I, I, you know, probably from your study, that there was a former census before. When people came out of Egypt, God told, count yourselves. That was census number one. Today the people are about to go into Canaan. God said, count yourselves again. How many years difference between them? 40 years. And look at the average. I have a few things I wanted to highlight. Number one, look at the total. It hasn't changed. Do you know that most, if not all, the generation died in the desert? Why? Because of their sin. They failed to trust God that he will bring them into the promised land. And we all know the story of the spies very well. And the price for that was they will not enter. They will all die and get buried in the desert. What about God's plan to bring the people into Canaan? God's plan cannot be thwarted. God's plan will prevail. It will happen. It will take place. And that proves it, that the people's number again reproduced and people again are close to 600. It was 603. Now it is 601,000. Close numbers. Number two. I'm going to go back here to show you this. This Zimri person was from what tribe? The tribe of what? Simeon. Apparently, they were not very godly people. Be otherwise, this man wouldn't have done this black deed that he did. And so when you come to look at the, the count, look at the tribe of Simeon in the first census. How much? 59,000. Look at it today. It's gone down to 20,000. From 60 to 20. Numbers are a blessing from God. That to me tells me that God is not blessing that particular tribe because of the people in it who are not faithful to him. Number two, look at the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah in the first census, the highest. And in the second census, the highest still. Why? What's coming out of that tribe? Jesus Christ will come out from the tribe of Judah. It's a superior tribe. It's a blessed tribe. And that's why the numbers are surprisingly high. Last but not least, zone in with me on the two sons of Joseph. Ephraim and the other guy is Manasseh. Manasseh, when they came out of Egypt in the first census, they were only 30,000. But in the second census, what are they? They're, they're almost doubled. This is a blessed tribe. And keep an eye on our subsequent studies. Every time something happens from the people of God is good and great, look and you'll see that they come from the tribe of Manasseh. It's a blessed tribe. In that <coughs> chapter 26, I'm not going to read it, of course, but I just want to tell you that the text talks about these four incidents. It talks about Nadab and Abihu. Who were they? They were the two priests who offered, thank you, Rehem, unauthorized fire. And fire came from God and burned them. How about the bottom one, Korah? We, how can we forget Korah? Korah, football. Korah, the guy who defied Moses and God defended Moses. And the earth opened up and swallowed Korah and all his people. And his friends, Datham and Abiram, were also burned before their families. Then who knows the story of Ur and Onan? Their names are recorded in Genesis and again in the book of Numbers. 
Those were evil people. Evil people. Ur was so evil that God got rid of him. And his father told his brother Onan, please go and marry your brother's wife and make children out of her. And he did something evil so as not to get her pregnant. Go back to the book of Genesis and read about these people. Those four incidents are described in the book of Numbers. Let's shift gears to those five women. Five women recorded in the text of the Bible. The Bible puts a halt to all the story of the people of God moving through the desert into Canaan to write for us about these five women. There must be something special about them. Five women, they are sisters, and their father died, and they have no brothers. So what should they be worried about when they go into the new land that they will not have land to live? Why? Because the law at that time protected mostly the men. If you're a man, you get a piece of land. If you are not, then you don't get a piece of land. These five women did the following. I'll quickly read it. The daughters of this man, Zelophad, he was the son of Herfer, who was the son of Gilead, who was the son of Machir, who was the son of Manasseh. What is, uh, Manasseh. See the tribe Manasseh? That tribe is blessed, and people who talk from it are very good people. What did they do? Verse 2, they stood to Moses and they said in verse 3, Our father died. He was not among the people of Korah, and we know that story. Number 4, why should our father's name disappear from the clan? Because he had no son. Give us a property among our, our relatives. So Moses, I love Moses again, and we learn a lot from him here again. What Moses did not make a decision. He took the case before who? Before God. Please, if you remember anything, you have a problem before you take it to your friends and your counselors, Put the problem before God in prayer. I'm not saying don't ask and don't do, go to the doctor and go to the lawyer and go to the accountant. But please, you and your spouse stand up in prayer and put that problem before God and see if he will put you through. And he will deliver. God said to Moses, what the girls are saying is correct. You must give them property of their father's inheritance. These five women, I tell you, they were brave. They went, as we said in the back room, through the right channels. They cared about their inheritance from the promised land. Let me ask you, and if there were five girls today, I'll ask them, do you care about your inheritance in the promised land? Do the young men and women of today, because the story is talking about women, care about their godly inheritance? How often do you think about your inheritance in heaven? About that land that is supposedly waiting for you? Jesus said, I am going up because there are many houses. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back and take you up. It is great if the young men and women of today think about their other home, their other land, their other inheritance beside the earthly land. I love it when God stood up for the right of women. The Bible stands up for the right of women. And today, the inheritance should be divided equally between men and women. If you have daughters and sons and you're passing an inheritance to them in the long run, <laughs> please make sure it is equally given. Unlike other religions and other faiths, and you all know what I'm talking about, 
where men get more than what women get. Moving on. The Lord, let's leave that story, move on to another story, also in the book of Numbers. The Lord called his friend Moses and told him, go up this mountain and see, not enter. See, not enter. You will only what? See the land I have given the people of Israel. I want to tell you something great. Moses was a very old man, but God gave him what? Pristine vision. You know, LASIK vision, surgery. Fantastic. He could see, and he could see so far away. He could see the whole land. And that is a lovely thing about our God, where he told Moses, go up to the mountain and see the land I've given you. This is an example of God's grace. But then he tells him, after you have seen it, you are going to die. And the words God used here is gathered to your people. Gathered to your people. When believers die, they don't, they're not lost. They are, they're, they're, they're not disintegrated. They will see their family members and their loved ones once again in the heavenly Jerusalem. Korah, when he died, he died in the earth. But when godly people die, they die up. After you have seen it, you will be gathered to your people, just like your brother Aaron. And he tells him why he will not enter. He tells him because when you rebelled, you both of you disobeyed my command. I want you to look on verse 13 where God tells him that after you have seen it, you too will die. He knew when he will die. We hear stories of saints in the church who miraculously know the time of their death. Saints and monks and godly people who are told when they will die. It happens. Let me ask you a question. If God came to us today and told us, you are going to die next week, what will you do? What will you do if you knew that next week is the last week you will live? What will you do? What will you think about? What are you going to, what, who will you call? Who would you visit? What documents would you sign? What prayers will you say? What will you do if you are going to leave? If God let you know that it is time for you to leave. I know what I will be doing. Do you? Moses here did not rebel. If I was Moses, I would say, oh God, really? Really? Is my, can you give me five more years? You know, there's a few things I have to do. I want to see the people grow up. I want to see things happen. I want to see this and I want to see that. But Moses did not say that. We quickly learned to say that Moses said he forgot about all of this. All he could think about is the people. He said, may the Lord who gives breath to all living things appoint someone to take care of the community. He cared about the people. Honestly, he did. That was his caring. And the word here gives breath to all living means God knows the inside, the inside of the heart. Take care of the people. What did God say? In verse 18, we read, God said to Moses, Take this man, Joshua, because he has the Spirit of God, and lay your hand on him. Laying of the hand. We see here the picture. Remember this guy. We are going to study the book of Joshua. Joshua, a very strong man in the Bible. A very strong leader that took over after Moses when Moses put his hands...
The Jewish feasts are such as seven feasts and they come in the spring and the fall. And you may know about some of them. Do you recognize the Passover? Of course we do. What is the Passover? It's, they celebrate the story of the passing over of the angel of death on top of their head. We too, we celebrate Passover. What or who is our Passover lamb? It is Jesus Christ. So the same time they celebrate in the spring their Passover, we have our great Good Friday and the death of Jesus Christ. Later, we see a few weeks after, still in the spring, they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you all know, because there is, they don't, God said, don't put yeast in your bread. Christ died a sinless life, and that was it, the meaning of that. After this, they celebrate the Feast of the First Fruits, usually in May. And after a few weeks, seven weeks, they celebrate the Feast of Weeks, which sometimes they call the Pentecost, or really the Hebrew friends in your workplace will tell you, we call it Shavuot. That is their celebration of the spring festivals. And then in the fall, they have these three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, or what we call Rosh Hashanah, and then they have Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and finally, the Feast of Tabernacles. I just want to tell you that all these feasts have a very prophetic meaning. In one sentence, those last three feasts have not happened yet. They will happen at the end of the church age. The Feast of Trumpets, when the trumpets will sound and Christ will come in His second coming and gather all the people of the world before Him. And then will come the Day of Atonement, which they call, what's the day called for the Jewish people? Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Judgment, where God will judge everyone according to His deeds. And then the good people will live with Christ forever in the heavenly Jerusalem, just like Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. So here they call the Passover the Pascha and the Feast of Weeks Shavuot, the Feast of Trumpets Rosh Hashanah, and then Sukkot towards November or so. I've added two feasts, or they have, they have two additional feasts in their calendar. Do you know what Purim is? It usually happens in March. Do anybody know what Purim is for the Jewish people? They celebrate the story of Esther, where their people were saved from the dying by Queen Esther. They've also added the Feast of Hanukkah, which is around our Christmas time. Anybody know what that feast is? It is the time when they were celebrated and they live. The last chapter, God says, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath, you must do it. Please, if you take an oath towards God, be sure to do it. If you take a vow before God, if you let me get this job, then I will do what you will. If you give me a son or a daughter and you get, then you must do it. If you pass an exam, if you do this or do that, make sure that you do it. A vow is like a pledge, is like an oath, is like a promise. It's like you're swearing. And since I said the word swear, I want you to remember that God said in verse 37, don't, don't swear. Verse 36, do not swear. Everything you say is simply yes or no. Too much talking doesn't help. Too much talking doesn't help. Let your yes be yes. What's in your heart, you say it. I know people today are very good at wearing masks. They want to say no, but they say yes. They want to frown at you, but you see a big smile. And then after you're gone, they give you 
and stab you in the back. It's called backbiting. That's what today is. But believers are different. What you have in your heart, say it. The last slide we're talking about it is not my words. It's the Bible that teaches us the husband has the final say. And we talked about this in the back room. Really, if you vow, you must discuss this with your husband. Don't do things alone. Don't take a vow on your own. Always discuss things together. You know, me and Maryam, we share something with you. Whenever me and her decide to do something together, together, we're both pray about it, we want to do it together, it is always a success story. And every time I decide to do things my way or Miriam decides to do things her way, it doesn't work. But when we do it together in harmony and we ask for God's blessings, it is always a success. Please, as husbands and wives, do things together. 50-50, 50-50. 50-50. But if you disagree, and this is where the problems begin, if you disagree, if you disagree, then we have to resort to the Word of God, which teaches that the women submit to your husbands. Hosanna Bible Study Groom meets every Friday, 7.30 p.m. till 9.30 p.m. at SMSV Church, 3300 Highway 7 East, Markham. The website is hosannabiblestudy.com where you can sign up for weekly emails and you will get emails about upcoming lecture and the questions and everything else.